So I okay. So let's get started here. <laughs> uh, it all it all revolves around the term Tartarus in Greek. So, um, so Justin caught something that I said, and actually it gave me the opportunity. I need to clarify something real quick before we go keep going, because I'm making a mistake going good. So I had I said twenty I said February March twenty twenty three. It's February March twenty twenty two. Would have been this year. So this is, let's chat about this for just a minute. Because this, actually, when he said that, I'm like, oh, I didn't talk about this. The one thing, the one thing that we have to understand is that when, well, let me, okay, let's, let's do this way. When did David become king of Israel? The date? Well, no. Was it at the time that he was anointed by Samuel, or was it the time that he took the throne physically? So, for the account, if you, may, if you don't know the account of David, he was a shepherd boy, out of the field. <clears throat> Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul did not please God. The Lord was very, was very sad that he appointed Saul to be king. God ends up appointing David, who ends up writing, I don't know, 80% of the book of Psalms, I would imagine, or more. I don't know what the actual number is, but, um, but Scripture says that, that David was a prophet. He was appointed king. There was, a, there, were, there was a day that Samuel the prophet anointed David, laid hands on him, and said, God has made you king. And then there was a period of time where he served underneath of Saul as king, as ruler, until Saul died, at which point David then stepped into the kingship. The, the reason I'm saying that is because when Justin brought up that I missed the year by, that I had said 2023 instead of 2022, it reminded me that we should talk about the beast, or any ruler for that matter, when, when did Alexander the Great rule the world? Right? There wasn't a date... It's not like he woke up one day and said, today I'm going to rule the world, right? He ended up conquering and conquering and conquering and conquering and conquering. And somewhere, in historical hindsight, we look back and we say, he ruled the entire world. There was probably a point in his kingdom where he said, I am ruling the entire world. Gee, my mom's going to be proud of me, right? But prior to that, I don't know that he either said or would have said until some future point in his ruling in his kingdom that he actually had or he was ruler of the entire known world. When we're looking at kings and kingdoms and scripture we've got to keep that in mind. So for example I think it's very possible that the beast man is alive and well right now. I think it's very possible that the beast man is already in his position as beast man even if he doesn't have a title. Doesn't mean that he's not ruling and that he doesn't have a kingdom. It just means that he doesn't have a title yet. Just like David. David was anointed king, I don't know how many, three years, whatever it was, prior to actually ascending the throne. He had the title. Later on, the title caught up with the fact that he had already been anointed as king, right? When we look at kingdoms like this, like the Medo-Persian Empire, when did they, when did they become the world kingdom at that point. It, sometime before Greece came in, because <laughs> Greece took it from them, right? Um, and so I say all that just to say this. Uh, don't, I don't want, I don't want us, I don't want me, and I don't want you to get fixated on dates. I think dates are fascinating, right? But I don't know that the dates will make total sense until we look at it in hindsight. We'll be past it, and we'll go, hey, that fit. Right? Um, like in this case, I, I said, I'm watching this next one, and I am. I am watching the upcoming cycle. And it's not just because I'm looking at the 1290 and the 1335. It's because there are a lot of other things that are lining up for me. And I'm thinking this could be a very interesting mix. Right? Will it be? I won't know until I look at it in hindsight. And that's how prophecy works. Prophecy is a lot like signs on the road. You're driving down the highway, and you see the big green sign up on the hill, 
and you see that it's a big green sign. But you're too far away and you really can't read the words. You just know that there's a sign there and you're looking for it. And so you look over on the side and you've got the little ones, 134, 134.3, 135, 136, those are the signs you can read because you're going past them super fast when you're going by, but you can at least read it as you're going by. But the sign is up on the hill, you're looking at it and you're saying, I know there are words on that, and all right now all I know is it's just a big green sign. And pretty soon you get up to it, and when you can finally read it, now you have a decision to make. And you, you have to decide, is the information on the sign valuable? Does it apply to me? Do I now make decisional adjustments based on the fact that I'm able to read the sign. And at the point you go past the sign, you're like, okay, I can no longer make decisions based on knowing the information on the sign. Now I have to ask myself, now that I'm past the sign, does the sign have any bearing on me? Because in time, we can't turn around and make a U-turn and go back, right? So when we're looking at prophecy and we're looking at things like this, for the most part, it's only ever going to make sense in hindsight, right? There are very few prophecies that are given to us in the scripture that have enough detail in advance to let us know. One of them that was given to us in advance where the Lord actually names two people, it's a prophecy talking about Jacob and Esau. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And so we know Jacob and Esau were brothers, right? And I'm like, why, if God is love, how could he hate anybody? Well, when you study that term hated, it means that God didn't want to do business with. That's, that term is a transactional term. So Jacob, God wanted to contractually do business with. Esau, God did not want to contractually do business with. But that prophecy was written a couple of hundred years before either of the boys were born, and it names them by name. So how would you like to grow up knowing that you're Jacob and your brother's Esau, and that there's a scripture that could be about you, Right? But even the boys didn't have any idea until afterward. Even when their names were on the prophecy. They didn't know that they were the Jacob and Esau of the prophecy because there were other Jacobs and other Esaus, right? So I'm saying all this just to say this. The best that we can do with anything that's prophetic is learn it, get the patterns down, pay attention, try to get as much detail as we can, and then start laying it as a filter over the top of what we're seeing in history. And as we see the blocks start to fill in, we go, mm, this could be it. It's like walking up to that sign. The sign starts to get clearer. It's like, oh, more and more of the pieces are fitting. More and more of the pieces are fitting. Darn, it didn't fit. <laughs> right? I guess I get to keep waiting for this to get fulfilled on something else. And so then, pretty soon, more of the pieces are fitting. More of them are fitting. Ah, it happened. It happened. We saw it happen, right? You can be on top of the roof. You can be in the country. You can be in the city and simultaneously see something happen at the same time. Because everybody has cell phones now. Uh, <clears throat> but but in hind it, it's always in hindsight. It's always in hindsight. Even Daniel. Daniel said, when I came to the conclusion that this prophecy had been fulfilled, I began seeking God with fasting and prayers. Because he's like, hey, our 70 years of exile are done. We get, we get out of jail, we get out of jail, yay! But we're not out of jail, we're still in jail. <laughs> so Daniel begins seeking God and, pro and fasting, and, and God's like, yes, Daniel, you're right. You're, 70 years are done, it's been fulfilled, and here's the rest of the story, right? When we're looking at these things, we've got to remember, there is a difference between the prophetic, in the sense that we have prophecy in Scripture, and the gift of prophecy that we see operating in the church that are one of the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of the prophecy, the gift of prophecy for today, as the Holy Spirit leads, is for edification, exhortation, consolation. It's a word spoken in due season that is edifying, consoling, exhorting, right? The person who works in the administration of prophet, a person who is a prophet, who works as a prophet, is the person who carries the responsibility.